There we go. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. This is the February 2023 session of the Virginia Tech Carilion Wilderness Medicine Journal Club. This month, we are going to be focused on leave no trace principles. Um, one of our fellows, Lydia Kuhn, will be uh, hosting this session, and Drew Parkinson is going to help us out with presenting the article and with some discussion points. So I'll be here in the background. Otherwise, I'm going to hand things over to Lydia. So Lydia, take it away. All right, well, thank you everybody for joining. I know it's kind of uh, late in the evening and people are trying to get dinner. Um, so thank you for bearing with us here. Um, I wanted to do an article and articles related to leave no trace principles, uh, which are really near and dear to my heart, um, partly because um, I through hiked the Appalachian Trail and I learned a lot uh, when I was on trail. And I realized that not only are leave no trace principles really important, uh, for us just as humans taking care of our earth, but actually they have quite a considerable impact if we don't follow them in the medical world. Uh, and I think that that intersection um, between kind of the things being taught by our national park systems for us uh, to be good stewards of our earth and how that affects us in the medical world is a very inter interesting intersection. So I am hoping that this will be interesting for you guys as well and maybe a little bit different view um, than you normally take uh, to things by, by doing these two articles. Um, I wanted to introduce actually a special guest as well. Um, I have Ms. DeForest Tuggle here with us um, who I met on the Appalachian Trail who was another through hiker and she is actually a leave no trace trainer. Uh, as well as she does uh, trail community development. Um, so she's kind of a special voice in here as well. And that if you have any questions actually at the end of this talk uh, that you wanna to direct to her, feel free. Um, otherwise I will let future doc Dr. Uh, Parkinson kind of take over and appreciate his help greatly and kind of going through these articles. Okay. Which article did you wish to start with? Uh, let's start with just like basic leave no trace. Um, just kind of going over what those principles are. I don't know if everyone is, is fully familiar um, with the fact that there are several. Oh, I just had the uh, Denali gastroenteritis article sent to me. What was the second one? Okay, so the leave no trace, they're just principles. And I know a lot of people don't have their uh, video on, but if you can, if uh, those who are willing to kind of unmute for a little bit, do you guys, are you guys all familiar with, with what leave no trace principles are? Yes. Okay. If everybody pretty familiar with those principles, we can go ahead and get into the article about the GI illnesses with the climbers in Denali. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to kind of read through them, just so you guys are familiar with them before we get into it. So the leave no trace principles are, um, they're actually uh, uh, seven uh, for those of you guys who are not familiar. And they're very easy stuff that you think about before you go into the backcountry. So it's plan ahead and prepare, uh, travel and camp on durable surfaces, dispose of waste properly, um, leave what you find, minimizing campfire impacts, uh, respecting wildlife and being considerate of other people on the trail. So obviously we're gonna break down kind of some of these a little bit with the article that we're about to go over, um, but I wanna have you kind of keep those in mind as we do that. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about uh, the, article that we are um, going to be discussing about GI illnesses and mountain climbers in Denali. Go ahead. Right. I will get the screen. The work. Um, so many screens open. All right. So GI distress on Denali. How the started was in um, 2002. There was a bit of an outbreak on Denali of on a a just short period of time. Numerous hikers came down with um, acute onset kind of diarrhea and GI distress, and it's the number of the hikers and they were all in groups kind of piqued some interest of what's going on here. And it's kind of a backup background. Here's our article. Uh, Denali, 
formerly known as Mount McKinley. It's the tallest mountain in North America, and the national park, which I had a chuckle when I hit this, is bigger than the state of New Hampshire. So the article itself, um, where this was, I think, published in 2005, um, the information gathered 2002, one, I didn't look at this weekend, I'm called weekend, 11 to the 14th, and why this was after the fact that they were curious if they could gather some information, um, what might be the etiology of why this group, and it's happened before, and it's probably happened since, but there was just so many that it piqued their interest. Um, they got to the base camp, which you'll see the map of shortly, and were of willing participants who were coming down the mountain. They asked them to fill out a questionnaire. Uh, they got a total of 132 climbers who were willing to self-answer a questionnaire, of which some of these questions might be, uh, hopefully they answered correctly, but some of them might be embarrassing were you to answer in the negative and the limitations were kind of, it's one spot, one location, one weekend. And again, some of these questions are a little bit on the, uh, oh, oh, I did not know that about myself level of, they might have changed their answer. Yeah, this is a beautiful picture. So these, this trip is routinely um, two, three weeks. And they said the, the average time for climbers was 18 days. Over the climbing period, there's about a thousand climbers that go up, and most of which I want to say at least greater than half were commercial guided climbers. And at the time of this article, there were only two pit latrines at 7,200 feet, which is base camp, and 14,200 feet, which has a med station of which several people who had contracted a bug. Um, one of them had to get evacuated. A couple had IV rehydration in the initial attention getting episode. So all the way up, I've got a map coming of, there are numerous less established camps, but all the way up, it's, there's no more, there's no more pit latrines. And general principle was either honor system of pack it out or crevasse it. Find the biggest hole you can, and as this chap is doing, chuck it in. Problem with the crevassing is, uh, for safety reasons, as it is a hole into the abyss, you do have to have a buddy system and some ropage to make sure you don't fall in and die. So it's adding more steps into the process of, hey, it's whatever time, and I need to go have a bowel movement. I've got to go get my crevasse buddy and just seem to add a few things. Um, this is the map. So the two pit latrines are at 7,200 feet at the very bottom and all the way up at 40, 14,200 feet. That's the next pit latrine. So everything in between those two is um, you're supposed to pack it, which this is the highest mountain on the North American continent or crevasse it. And numerous of the questionnaires reported they saw fecal matter on the snow they may or may not have crevassed it the vast majority to acquire water got snow from as you go higher shorter and shorter to camp and statistically as they went higher people went shorter distances from camp for both collecting snow and depositing other all the way to the top and that became the issue um, the means of sterile there the means of making water were listed as did you boil water yes and we'll get into that a little bit later as to their means of making water and the plausibility of sanitation behind that but this map just out of context of there's only two pit latrines on this whole mountain and everything else is supposed to be either chucked into the nearest abyss hole called a crevasse or carry it to 20,000 feet where you're already fighting for air. Yeah, self-administered might be the shortcoming here. And self-reported diarrhea. Uh, the article mentioned the impracticality of 
collecting carried samples and also the lack of participation with their climbers who answered the questionnaire. As it said, they were usually hustling to catch the next um, air taxi out from 7200. So they were unable to capture any sample for determining why, why do they have these nausea, vomiting, or not exactly nausea, but diarrhea defined as loose stools and malaise. So the higher, uh, was it six, sixty-nine uh, percent of our small group at seventeen thousand feet saw a significant amount. So the the means of they're using the restroom outside of the pit latrines were things such as wiping with snow or a rock or toilet paper. But then they're expected to either pack it or crevasse it. And their hand hygiene was self-reported, which if they're not going to be at an established camp, finding water for the sake of hand hygiene is going to be difficult. And that also brings in another problem with the acquiring water aspect, but also the close quarters of the, the probability of a group having a sort of a communal spread of their gastroenteritis if they were all sharing a tent was significantly higher than if they were not if they were fewer people in the tent they had less if one person had it they had less spread but if there were multiple people in the tent and somebody had it it was more than likely to spread to everybody so back to this um the problems i looked up as they're going up, the the boiling temperature decreases dramatically, and up here at about seventeen thousand feet, the boiling temperature of water is only one hundred and sixty degrees Fahrenheit. For about uh, yeah, um, the the sort of just moniker or just unread of just boiling water makes it safe works. Sea level two hundred and twelve that kills about most anything, and for um safety sake letting it boil for a minute will work um these chaps they boiled their water which was a lower temperature about 160 degrees at some spot which um per looking up some survivability i could not find one for norovirus specifically but once it, its family could survive 160 degrees for 30 minutes which means unless these guys were boiling their water for 30 minutes they were they were not killing the pathogen and uh, the question was not posed did you boil and then chemically sanitize your water that would very plausibly have been effective so there's just a couple of shortcomings of the limited time limited self-reporting and some of these things of did you wash your hands after you um, defecated might have skewed some of the answers and it's self-reporting after a three-week hike of do you remember on your way up or down these details and the means of which they got water and their process of and how they stayed. It, it's not exactly. It's still three weeks out from a very strenuous thing. We'll say memory might be a little skewed. But it has some points of the 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 emphasis on hygiene was not there and also the practice of either crevassing or packing was not working and some uh, thoughts on actually holding people to a standard of you have to pack it not it's not we would really like you to you have to or we're not going to issue permits so the kind of interesting thing i just want to touch base in here if that's okay um is you know the idea of leave no trace and those principles that were kind of outlined in in the you know the other article that you guys were sent um the whole idea of leave no trace specifically as it is connected to this article is that um disposing of waste properly right and you know for those of us you know here in virginia who are hiking along the appalachian trail 
that can mean everything from obviously using the pit privies that they have here or, you know, going out and, you know, digging your six to eight inch deep, you know, cat hole um, and make sure that's covered. And areas that are, you know, alpine in areas where there are snow, it's definitely, you know, you pack it out. Um, and specifically in this article, the, the reason why I kind of wanted to get into this and see that connection between leave no trace principles and what occurred on Denali and honestly what continues to occur in a lot of alpine areas is that, you know, you know these climbers, they had access only to two latrines um, at different uh, levels along their mountaineering trip. And, you know, we didn't get into the whole, you know, were the latrines appropriate, were they over full, were they managed appropriately, but, you know, regardless of that, even if they use those latrines, all of those other areas that they were hiking did not have that available to them. And as we saw in the article, a lot of people were describing, you know, when those latrines weren't available to us and we were at camps, uh, we saw a lot of fecal matter in the snow, meaning people were going and uh, defecating in the snow. They were not packing it out and they were leaving it there, which causes a whole host of problems. Um, but also as they got higher onto the mountain, I mean, you can imagine having to crevasse, uh, you know, your, your fecal waste, um, you know, kind of, you know, as, you know, Christian, you were mentioning is, you know, you had to be roped in to be able to, to you know, dispose of your waste properly in the crevasse. And that, that's a lot of effort to be able to do that. And I'm sure a lot of people were just trying to, you know, find easier ways to get around that, to be able to take care of themselves and their waste, but they weren't doing it properly. Um, and the issue that we were seeing is specifically in this situation that by uh, not practicing leave no trace principles, by uh, defecating in the snow near their campsites, by not packing it out, um, uh, by not obviously uh, doing proper hand hygiene, et cetera, that they were having outbreaks of GI illness. Um, and kind of some of the questions that I wanted to get into, which the article actually did pretty well addressing is, Number one, why were those principles, you know, of leave no trace of packing it out or, you know, putting your fecal waste into a crevasse? Why, what was the barrier there? Um, and I would love to ask, open this up to you guys and let you guys unmute yourselves a little bit. Like what was the barrier that they had that they weren't able to practice those principles well? Open it up guys, anybody want to respond? So let's say you're hiking a glacier on, or on the Denali, you're at over 11,000 feet. What do you think would make it tough for you to follow Leave No Trace? It's cold up there. Yeah. You might be a little hypobaric, hypoxic, might be a little tired, headache, kind of grumpy because you're out in cold. Um, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to have to follow the same principles um, without causing risk of GI distress for your entire team. Or, I mean, honestly, if like you get um, hyponatremic, hypokalemic, hypomagnesemic, it's going to make your, from diarrhea, it's going to make your trip a little, little bit harder. You're already up high. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but yeah, has anybody had to dispose of waste in, um, in an alpine environment? And like this questionnaire, it might lead to some false answers, but <laughs> I have in Peru. Was it complicated compared to typical backpacking? Yes. Because <laughs> the ground is really hard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was going to say the porta toilet in Peru was uh, first time sitting on the five gallon bucket. It was very um, interesting, but and it's just another thing to carry. Yeah. So I remember the first time I went canyoneering and uh, we were going to be doing two days out there. And my friend who was kind of leading me in this, uh, uh, I kind of just cautiously asked like, so how does this work with, you know, extra things? And he handed me a wag bag, which at that point I had no idea what that was. And I was like, you want me to do what with what? 
<laughs> and I remember thinking it was, you know, oh, okay, this is real. Like, you know, we're, we're packing things out. We're, we're definitely not going to leave it here in the canyon where it can't decompose. Um, so it is, it, it's difficult, right? Like if you're in these austere environments, if you're hiking at 17,000 feet, number one, it's hard to breathe. It's hard to carry your own pack and thinking about adding any weight to that, even if it's your own, um, is overwhelming. And then just finding, you know, the way to do it, it's difficult. Um, so, I mean, these are real, these are real barriers uh, of like, what do we do when people are in this environment and, and how do we teach this well? Because guess what? It's not just about being uncomfortable for a little bit, trying to pack this out. It's actually got pretty significant um, issues that are going to occur if we don't practice these principles. And this article shows that, right? Um, you know, you had these people that are, you know, disposing of their waste in and around camp on top of snow. They're not packing it out. Uh, then other people are going and collecting their water sources from snow that is nearby these areas. Um, or, you know, things warm up. Uh, obviously, you get, uh, you know, water being created and runoff uh, from fecal matter that's on the snow. I mean, it's not a pleasant or pretty thing to talk about, um, but it really is important because when you have uh, a bunch of people who are sick in an austere environment, and you may think diarrheal illness, that's not that big of a deal, but it is if you're where they are. It is if you're out in the middle of nowhere. It is if you can't, you know, keep yourself hydrated um, and all of a sudden you're needing an evacuation and not just you, but your entire team is, uh, and everybody is at risk uh, because uh, certain principles that are in place to help prevent that weren't followed. Um, and that's kind of what I really want to get in and, and, and have you start thinking about, and I'd love to discuss this, um, you know, with leave no trace principles, uh, I want to try to discuss with you how uh, these principles, if not followed, can affect us from a medical aspect. Um, so obviously we've talked about uh, disposal of waste properly. Um, and to dive into that a little bit further um, before we move on, I kind of wanted to ask questions. If, if anybody knows just in general, um, how long certain bacteria uh, from the gut can survive uh, basically in feces in different environments? Has anybody uh, looked into that or, or know anything about that? I have not. Anybody else? Okay, well, I looked up some of this with the article and I thought it was really interesting. So um, obviously main bacteria that are, are in stool, e, um, e. coli being a big one, but E. coli, cholera, all of those can be capable of surviving kind of indefinitely in tropical environments, um, especially in like tropical water. Uh, enteric and viral pathogens uh, usually only survive a couple of days outside of the body. Um, Shigella, Salmonella, Hepatitis A, Cryptosporidium uh, can actually survive for weeks to months when frozen. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, the reason why we talk about, uh, at least in, in areas like where we are here in Virginia and the Southeast, um, we are able to do the cap holes six to eight inches deep and cover those uh, because of the type of earth that we have here. Um, and it's a, a relatively moist environment. It does break down a lot of that bacteria and viruses, um, but they can still survive in the area for weeks to months. When you get to sand, really dry areas, the idea is you always pack it out because it does not degrade as well. Um, and then in the alpine environments and uh, subalpine where it's really cold or where you have permafrost, you absolutely have to pack it out. Um, frozen fecal waste can actually contain uh, bacteria that can survive for a really long time if they become frozen. Uh, interestingly enough, this has been a topic relatively recently about emerging pathogens that we're seeing from uh, hundreds of thousands of years old as the permafrost actually starts to melt, uh, that we're seeing these pathogens be able to reactivate uh, and cause us harm. So everything that we are doing right now has the potential to affect us in the future. And being aware of how you yourself um, act when you're out in austere environments and how you protect your surrounding environment um, and pack out your waste, et cetera, really does have a longstanding impact on the environment. 
one way to kind of talk about this is a little math problem that I, <laughs> I wrote up for you guys. And I hope that Justin sent out just to kind of give you an idea of how, how big this issue can be, um, was, I don't know if you guys received it in your email or not. Did you guys receive my math problem? <laughs> I copied and pasted what you sent in the email to everybody. So I hope that people got it. Was it about the average weight of uh, okay. human fecal matter and how that adds up? I can't hear. Did you hear him, Lydia? I think you were saying it correctly. I, I'm sorry, my internet is uh, it sounds like I'm kind of losing my internet connection. Um, yeah, so based, no, I couldn't hear him, but I think he was reading it. Was, did he read the question? I think you had it, Drew, what was it? Oh, the average weight or mass of human fecal matter per person per day. And yeah, I thought about that when it said a thousand climbers going the two pit latrines on one mountain that uh, that crossed my mind. I think you're muted, Lydia. Oh. That's why I went home instead of holding my computer at the Virginia elective today. So I think she's frozen. Um, basically what we're getting to is stool shouldn't be left in campsite, shouldn't be left on scene. Does anybody know how far away you should be uh, leaving waste if you're bearing it from your campsite? Oh, I want to say the guidelines I was reading for backwoods <laughs> backpacking were 150, 200 feet. Lydia, what I asked was how far from campsite would, if you're burying it, would human stool be buried from campsite? Yeah, so it needs to be, yeah, it needs to be at least 200 feet away from your campsite and it needs to be 200 feet away from water sources as well. And right. preferably it needs to be in an area that if there were to be a lot of rain, it would not wash down into a water source. Um, so that's a great question. And I'm sorry, my internet has not been super great. I keep getting pushed off. So um, as far as the math problem that I gave, I don't know if you guys talked about it or not. It was, um, I gave a scenario on the Appalachian Trail. So in general, I said um, about 4,000 people attempt to hike the Appalachian Trail every year. Um, most of them will start southbound and go up north. So end up going northbound. Um, at any given designated campsite, there are approximately six people there every night for the duration of the season of through hiking, which is anywhere from six to seven months. So we'll say seven months. If everybody poops once at that campsite, over the course of seven months, how much fecal material is that? And to give you a little update, everybody poops about 0.3 pounds per time they defecate. So 0.3, for six people per night for the duration of a through hiking season, which is seven months. So how much is that at one site along the Appalachian Trail? Anybody have a quick calculator? How many people was it? Um, we'll say six people at, at a given campsite every night for seven months along the Appalachian Trail. And 0.3 is about how much uh, per bound movement. <laughs> yeah, now, if we average out to 30 days a month, that's, uh, that's a lot. It is. I got it's 378. Gonna... Yeah, so that's 378 pounds. Yeah. At one campsite along the Appalachian Trail, there are I think at least a hundred designated campsites. And I can't remember how many shelters, 200 shelters. And those are designated, not the ones that other people are staying at that are otherwise undesignated. So that's one year for one season, one campsite. 
So think about if people are not doing things properly, how much that is, how much bacterial load that is, how many potential virus problems that is. It's huge, right? It's a lot. So I want you guys to start thinking about how, how big this problem can be when we're not doing it properly and how that can really affect the health and well-being of ourselves and others uh, by how we act and what we do. Now, on a side note, um, what do you guys think as far as the leave no trace principles uh, that you have listed? Do you see any ways that not abiding by those might cause health problems or medical issues? Let's talk about campfires. So the leave no, oh, go ahead, sorry. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mute myself and I take up. So let's, let's talk about that. So the first principle, plan ahead and prepare, that makes a lot of sense, right? So if people do not plan ahead and prepare, uh, the type of medical repercussions for that, can, can you imagine? What if, what if somebody decides to go in the back country and they don't have a plan, they don't prepare, uh, they didn't bring the right clothes, they didn't bring a map. Um, I mean, that is your basic search and rescue scenario, right? That's the person who's not properly dressed who goes into the back country and either they get cold and hypothermic or maybe they're hyperthermic because they didn't bring enough water because they didn't realize how long the trail would be um, or they didn't have a map and they got lost. Um, so basic leave no trace principle that without doing properly can definitely lead to, to issues down the road. Um, the next one was travel and camping on durable surfaces, um, which includes not camping near water. Uh, can anybody like right on a riverbank? Can anybody think of potential issues if somebody were to do that? You've got erosion, you've got waste disposal, like we've been talking about. There's a whole host of things. Yeah. Um, maybe even depending on where they are, flash flooding, right? That actually happened to me. Uh, interesting story. I had a beautiful uh, camp spot, or at least what I thought, nice flat area right by the stream. I didn't have to go anywhere to collect my water. Um, thought I'd found the perfect campsite. Um, was pretty low, uh, and there was a little bit of a hill, and the stream went up. Um, and I'd already set up my entire camp. And uh, this gentleman actually um, was camping kind of high up on the hill and he came down after I was all set up and super happy. And he said, it's gonna rain tonight and you're in a flood zone. <laughs> and I said, oh yeah, that's um, probably not a good place to camp. And I ended up having to move. But something that never even occurred in my brain, it was not a designated campsite, which, you know, bad on me, I'm learning. Um, but I didn't even see the potential danger that was there until someone showed it to me. So things to keep in keep in mind. Um, you know, number three, disposing of waste. We're talking about um, leave what you find. Uh, obviously, not not picking up. Uh, you know, plant life or taking animal life home with you and doing things like that. That makes a lot of sense. Why we wouldn't do that. Um, minimizing your campfire impacts uh, is uh, number five. So making sure your campfires are completely out. Um, can anybody think of if we if we don't do that, if we leave a smoldering fire and we walk away, what are some of the issues that can happen and how can that um, cause medical issues? Anybody kind of think of that? As a former firefighter, I can say that causes problems. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Who um who was outside and enjoying recreation? I guess it was was it last year or the year before when there were all those organ fires that blew over the United States? Yeah. So how does that affect us medically? Well, can you imagine smoke in the air and breathing that in is very helpful for you guys? I think that could cause some problems. I'm sure the the firefighter here would definitely be able to understand that. One thing I think, like when we read all these articles and when we talk about carrying out your waste, is actually how that's done. Mm -hmm. um, can we go? Like, I'm assuming you're not just using like a tiny little thin Ziploc bag. Um, so, can you go over what you're actually using or recommend? Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, there are a couple of different ways to do it depending on what activity you're doing. So um, is there anybody here who does any water related activities like prolonged rafting trips? Has anybody done that? Yeah, I do. I'm a long distance rafting guide. Um, and what kind of things do you do to, to take care of waste or waste disposal? Yeah, so there's a few things. Um, like you already mentioned before, if it's a pretty like low profile trip with not a lot of storage space, like if you're in a canoe or a pack raft or something, you can always do the wag bag situation, <laughs> which is unfortunately um, basically a Ziploc bag, a fancy, fancy Ziploc bag that you might bring like a, you know, tear down toilet seat. Um, but then if you get kind of fancy and if you have like a really big raft and you might be doing like, you know, a several week trip, like in the Grand Canyon, you, uh, as I think Matt just said, Matthew just said, um, you have a groover or basically a ammo box repurposed with a toilet seat on it, or you're just, um, pooping in the ammo box and notably, um, not peeing in it because <laughs> the reaction that, the bacteria can have with the contents of urine produces a lot of gas and they can explode. And so you don't do that. Um, don't be in the groover. And you have to unfortunately also periodically uh, burp them. So you burp the ammo boxes <laughs> just to make sure that they don't also explode in the hot desert. Um, but yeah, those are the two main ways that I have done it. And so, I just reaffirm the importance of properly disposing of them after you're done with your trip. Um, I, my sister is a health inspector in Moab, uh, Utah, which is what is it, Grand County, I believe. So Grand County County Health Inspector. And, you know, there's Arches National Park is right there. So they have backpackers with that need to dispose of their wag bags after use. And for a little while, the city didn't have a proper disposal area for like the national park goers so they would literally just drive by neighborhoods open up people's trash cans in their front yards and dump weeks worth of people's waste in their wag bags and people's trash cans so if you're going to a park if you're going to a you know national forest anywhere don't just raid somebody's trash can there look for a designated spot um and it was like a, a big um big problem because arches is a very populated state park or a very heavily visited national park that's nothing compared to yosemite zion you know um yellowstone and places like that glacier so i mean it gets pretty bad at these places like you think of whitefish up in uh, montana like it's not a huge area but hopefully each of these places have a proper disposal area and just keep in mind that people live in these places we travel to for fun and we're trying to keep it nice so we can keep going there. Justin, that's really interesting. So what is, what is, do you know what your sister has been doing to try to address that out of my own curiosity? I think they posted a lot of um, flyers and they had like, they started finding people. I don't know how big the fines were, but it was, uh, it incentivized proper disposal. And then they had like, um, dumpsters that were set up specifically for it. And then the signs like, go here please yeah. don't go to this like don't go to this poor old lady's front yard <laughs> that would be a very poor neighborhood watch job but one that would be very appreciated by everyone i'm sure i'd be like oh you caught the you, you caught the pooper guy putting all the poop in the trash can thank goodness that's we terrible one of those up in michigan for a while um they would just go to people's front doors but um yeah then you take that in national park settings and um so it's not just leaving a trace where you're having your fun and going backpacking it's like afterwards too um and actually matt just brought up a good point i don't mean to just constantly segue but lydia can you go over like she just gave a talk about safety with uh bear prevention getting into your stuff it's kind of leaving no trace you want to talk about it actually it 100 percent is leave no trace um so I'm trying to remember which one this is. Respect wildlife is part of where I think that would kind of fit in. Um, so I did. I just gave a WMS lecture on proper food storage in the backcountry, specifically as it relates to bears. So as another leave no trace principle that has um, basically uh, repercussions for not only our health, but obviously the environment. 
So when it comes to properly storing your food in the backcountry, um, a lot of people, you know, obviously go out, want to do multi-day backcountry trips um, and bring their own food. And some people just, we don't think about, okay, well, you know, obviously we have the food in our backpacks. We have what we want to eat. Um, and it's with us. We just keep it with us. We're going to keep it in our tent. It'll be on the ground, you know, whatever. And we don't think about what can happen. And the biggest thing is, you know, animals can get into our stuff. And we really need to think about ways to keep it off the ground and keep it away from critters being able to get into our food. And there are a lot of reasons for that. Um, number one, we do not want to condition animals uh, to being used to eating human food. Um, it's bad for them and their digestive tracts, just like it is for us. Uh, but it's also bad to create kind of this dependence on human food by critters, including bears. Um, and we want uh, these animals kind of becoming accustomed to looking at us as potential food sources because we have food sources on us. Um, and, you know, obviously that can lead to a lot of really bad things, uh, including, you know, big animals like bears uh, becoming more uh, habituated to humans and, and uh, associating us with potential food it can cause harm to us, but it can cause harm to animals as well, because as that happens, um, you know, Oftentimes bears can uh, be euthanized because of that type of behavior. Um, so ways that we can actually properly store our food really depends on where you are in the country and where you're traveling. Um, obviously your national park services are great resources for trying to help um, you plan and prepare for your trip and know exactly what you need to do. Um, but options of course are uh, using food storage containers that are at campsites, which sometimes they have like metal food lockers, uh, metal bear hangs. Um, if you're in an area where you have to do it yourself, either hanging a food bag, uh, which means that you are hanging it on a limb at least 12 to 15 feet off the ground and uh, really four to five feet, five, six feet even away from the trunk of the tree so a bear can't get it, um, or carrying a bear canister, which is uh, basically just a really thick uh, plastic container that bears can't actually get into. Um, and packing your food and everything that has smell into that, meaning toiletries, your toothbrush, toothpaste, you know, your lotions, your shampoo, your conditioner, anything that has scent, um, obviously your trash and food go into that and go away 200 feet away from your campsite. Um, and cooking the same thing it needs to be 200 feet away from your campsite. So yeah, it is, uh, it is the bare necessities. That is the lecture that I gave, the bare necessities, the art of hanging it up while you're hanging out, the uh, proper food storage in the back country. Um, is actually proper food storage. So Justin, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I think we lost you there for a minute, but we got your last sentence again. No, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, the internet, the internet's really not so great here and everybody's being pretty good, I think, about trying to be off of it. It's just not very stable. No, it's not. It's really not. Sorry. Um, so it, it, this would be easy to segue off into, you know, water disinfection, um, hand sanitization, it all does at the end of the day boil back down into leave no trace because if you're not cleaning your hands afterwards you're not going to be able to collect your stool because it's not going to be solid so um <laughs> so you'll want to make sure you have proper water disinfection uh at least two methods filtration and chemical filtration and uv whatever you like um Every patient, every, I'm so used to saying patient, every person in your group having their own hand sanitizer, the lovely group hand sanitizer in the camp is a uh, cesspit of itself. The little pump handle is disgusting because everybody, it's the first thing they touch after coming back from the lovely bathroom tree. So just keep that in mind. You have your own hand sanitizer. Um, Lydia had a great point today when we were talking about like preparing for this. If you have a personal or a group trowel, if you're digging a hole to bury waste, you don't pick up the waste with your trowel and then scoop it into the hole. It's just to dig your hole and then you can use a stick or a log or whatever to bury it back down. Um, 
it's kind of a party foul to scoop scoop your waist in a camp trowel and then just bring it back to the group setting and like, here you go. You're up. <laughs> so make sure this you, was you a discussion that we just had. <laughs> Ever uh, get poop on your trowel. <laughs> <laughs> especially if it's somebody else's. Yeah, especially if you're you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that just those two alone will help lead to a increased uh, likelihood that you won't get a GI distress in a trip. But as an example, kind of like what Drew talked about, the Denali mountain of you know, just, I'm just imagining just littered with stool. But um, there was an article, I can't remember how many years back in the Grand Canyon is a river rafting trip where the whole group, and this was a big raft. It was not like just six people. It was, I think, 18 or more people. And they all had a norovirus outbreak on the Grand Canyon in a raft where they each, they, they just find it, you know, a little side output each night and they can put out uh, or take out. And then every one of them had just dis, you know, just explosive diarrhea on this trip. That just would have been just a nightmare. So um, it can definitely end a trip. So funny that you actually mentioned the Grand Canyon. Um, last year, there was an outbreak on the trail. Actually, I think it was the Bright Angel Trail. Um, and I was hiking the trail. Um, I think it must have been just after this happened. And I wasn't actually aware of it until later. And there was a norovirus outbreak. And the people that were obtaining water from, I can't remember where the water source was, was contaminated. And people had to be evacuated. They were having such severe nausea, vomiting. Um, and diarrhea that they couldn't physically hike themselves out and had search and rescue come get them. And that was multiple people. Um, so yeah, not, not, uh, not a good thing, not a good thing to get. Right. So food, food storage for bear prevention and leave no waste, waste management after and during a trip and afterwards, hand sanitization, disposing of liquid and solid stool appropriately hiking it out versus burying it. And um, that alone will get you pretty far with leave no trace. And then you add in the proper fire care afterwards and planning where to put your fire, all of that ties back into leave no trace. Any questions? Yeah. Because I think our uh, elective, so uh, our participant here, Tony Zyke is the representative of our WMS um, Virginia elective. So the Tony Zyke is uh, the meeting group of our whole elective right now. Lydia, do you think any of them have any questions since they were going on a backpack trip on what, Saturday or Friday? Tony, I'm putting you on the spot because you're the name on the board. All... I'm in a different room, so I can't tell. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Yeah, any any questions that you have about this? I, I don't know if you guys are climbers, and I'm not familiar with this. The uh, I, I can never remember the name of the PVC piping that some of the climbers take the poop shoot. Um, I, I don't know. Is there like a strategy? I, I people, I guess, make them. Is there a strategy of making or carrying them while you're actually climbing? Do you Ooh, mean that's a good pitch or like big wall climbing? Like uh, like some of the alpine environments of oh, mountaineering, you know, as okay. opposed to like, crevassing, actually, you know, using your tube. I am not familiar with the lovely tube method. Yeah, does anybody else here climb that's in the group? I'm also not as familiar with using a tube. Well, that is something for us all to look at because now I'm yeah, sure, so yeah, I know. No, I'm really homework. curious too. I want to say it was in one of the hour box chapters, and I, I can't remember which one offhand. But oh, way to bring in the hour box. Way to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With, with that being said, Lydia, do you have any other points or Drew, any other points? I think we covered quite a bit. Yeah, we did. Yeah, I think just, you know, leave no trace, guys. Like there are reasons behind these principles and it can really help us out from the medical standpoint as well as just like the, the protecting our environment. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks everybody. Next month is uh, Women's Care in the Wilderness. Um, a surprisingly, very rarely talked about topic. 
it affects slightly over half of the world's population directly and everybody else indirectly. <laughs> so, That's right, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, kind of segues from the leave no trace principles because anything you ladies uh, have to hike out is going to not have to be uh, done in a improper method. So that is going to directly segue as well. Um, so otherwise, thanks for joining. Uh, this recording should be uploaded uh, to YouTube and available uh, pretty shortly. Just need the WMS staff to get that done for me. So I'm going to end recording.